as we continue in, the, in the, this whole study of the whole armor of God, uh, we're going to continue, uh, we're continually are needed, or we are continually reminded that we need this, and this is why, and why this is such an important subject. In verses 10 through 13, um, it introduces the subject of spiritual warfare. We are told that the saints of God are engaged in a great cosmic spiritual battle against a powerful and relentless enemy. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer, you are considered by, you know, what the Bible says, as a saint of God. So that means that if you are a saint of God, a believer in Christ, you do, um, you are involved in spiritual warfare. There's no sitting on the sidelines when it comes to uh, spiritual warfare. If you're a Christian, it's going to happen. The reason why, you know, most likely it's probably not happened quite as much as like with the heathen is because Satan doesn't care about those who are unsaved because he already has them. All right? He already has them at that point. But our enemy, uh, you know, that we know of is the devil, and our enemy is said to employ what he calls the wiles. You know, this word refers to, you know, tricks and different schemes and methods that he's going to use to undermine the faith of the saints and to attack the glory of God. What he, he knows that he can't get your soul. He knows that he, can't, he, that he can't take away your salvation. But he can sit there and undermine your faith in the fact that he's going to try to render you to be useless and powerless. When we hold on you know, to sin in our life, when we, don't, you know, when we realize that we sin, you know, that we have sinned, what we should do is ask you know, God to forgive us to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as his word says, because the Bible says that if you confess that, uh, you know, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so we should do that, you know, as quick as we realize it. We shouldn't say, well, I'll do it later, or I'll wait until tomorrow, or anything else. If you're like me, I have a hard time, like, I'll sit there and think of something and walk into the room and forget it. So you might as well go ahead and, and do it while it's on your mind. If, if I don't have a piece of paper, I'm like, you know what, I better just go do it right now while it's on my mind. And even I'll even walk into a room with that in mind and forget. So do it, you know, as quick as you can. And that's just about stuff, just, you know, about like, hey, I came in the kitchen. What did I come in here for? Well, if you go into the kitchen and you know you're, it has to be for food. I say that because I've walked in the kitchen and say, what was I going to get? And forgot, you know, the reason why. And then I walk out and go, oh, yeah, I was going to get lunch. Thanks, Doc, for making me, you know, for making me, you know, uh, you know, not to feel as bad. But God's command, uh, God commands His people. Uh, he commands His people that they are to stand against the, ta- the attacks of the enemy. We see this in verses eleven, verses thirteen and fourteen. The word "stand" is a military term. It's not just the fact of you be going, okay, I'm standing. But it's the fact that you know uh, it's a military term. It means to hold a critical position during a time of an enemy attack. Basically, to hold your ground. It's not backing down. It's not backing up. It's to hold your ground. So, uh, there's, uh, you know, we have this image of a soldier refusing to yield, to, uh, even to give up an inch of ground to an attacking foe. Is the fact that you're saying, "I'm going to stay here. I'm going to, you know, not be moved." As the Bible, all, uh, you know, oftentimes says, "I'm going to be unshakable, unmovable. You're not going to be able to get me." That's what he is talking about, to stand, is that we are to stand in that way. This is not an image of someone, uh, someone who is on the offense. It's not somebody who is on the offense, because every single thing, there's only, there's only one offensive weapon, and we'll get onto that later on, which is the sword of the spirit. Everything else is defense. And that's how um, we are to look at it. That it's not someone that's on offense, but rather it is a picture of a soldier on the defensive, protecting the ground that has already been won. Now, I wanted to emphasize that it's the fact that we are defending the ground and protecting the ground that has already been won. God has given his people some very precious possessions. He has given us truth. He has given us his church. He has given us his word. He has given us uh, grace and salvation and blessing and a a whole myriad of other ones. You know, I don't want to sit here all night just talking about what God has given us because he's given us a lot. And that would be the whole night right there and, and, uh, and and then some. So the devil wants all of it. He, wants, he will stop at nothing to take everything we have been given by the Lord. He wants to take away our blessing. He wants to take away uh, you know, his word. He wants to take away the church. He wants to take all those things. He wants you to even get to the point of saying, you, you know what, Am I, was I really saved? 
when I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, when I put my full faith and trust in him, did I really? And what does God's word say? That if you do that, you are saved. But he wants us to even doubt the fact that we got saved in the first place. If we, uh, if we are to keep um, what we have received from the Lord, we must stand and hold on uh, the critical ground we have received from the Lord. To do that, God says that we must put on the whole armor of God. If we take away one piece or one, you know, one part of the armor of God, we're going to be susceptible to attacks. And the enemy is going to keep on hitting those areas, these small areas, over and over again until he gets access somewhere. He's not going to give up. He's relentless. He's going to keep doing it because, you know, like I said, he wants us to be rendered useless and powerless. The passage that we just read talks about the different uh, talks about the pieces which constitute uh, this armor. And like uh, uh, weeks before, we talked about the belt of truth, or as it says here, um, as it says in uh, verse uh, fourteen, it says, "Having your loins girded about with the truth." That is the belt of truth. And then we talked about the, bless, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, which is talked about in the same verse in verse 14. It says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The belt of truth uh, refers to a life of total commitment to the Lord. Now, when I say these things like of total commitment, says, well, somebody says, I have to be perfect. I can never sin. I can never. You can't do that. You can never be you know, perfect. But that's why we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Because he's the one who's going to protect us. He's the, you know, it's by his blood that we are saved. His shed blood upon that washes us and makes us quite, uh, white as snow. But we are to put on the whole armor of God knowing that we're going to go out to battle every single day. Because we don't know what the day has in store. We could sit there and have you know, a schedule of things. i got to do this, this, and this. And you know that schedule is going to change. It should always have at the bottom subject to change because it's going to. So it, it refers to a life that is built upon the faithfulness, upon faithfulness to the word of God and to the God of the word. It speaks of uh, truth in testimony and truth in living. This belt of truth will provide the Christian, uh, Christian sol uh, soldier stability. And it also provides a place uh, for the other pieces of the armor to rest. Without the belt of truth, the, the soldier of God will find the other places of the armor are useless. Because if you don't, if you're not, if you don't have the truth, you have nothing. The belt, uh, the breastplate of righteousness refers to the power of a holy life, a holy life that is a life that is lived according to the teachings of uh, teachings in His Word is a powerful defense against the attacks of the enemy. We were uh, talked about that um, at that time that the you know the, that the seed of the emotions that the you know that um, uh, the seed of the emotions and also the uh, uh, the willpower of the mind was lo you know the will uh, the will and the mind are, are were located in the heart. That's why it says that's why you'll hear sayings of do it with all your heart or put your heart into it. And the seed of the emotions, you know, back then, you know, was considered to be in the bowels. The emotions or your uh, their feelings, you know, were in there. So it was like you know that's why you know there's you know those certain sayings about those like a lot of times you'll read about you know it says bowels of mercy or whatever in the bible he's talking about your emotions he's talking about those feelings and when we allow sin to dwell in our lives that's the part that's not the fact that we're going to be perfect but if we allow sin to dwell in our life that's where satan's going to you know as the bible says you're going to give place to the enemy if we allow it to sit in there and we don't repent of it you know we don't ask god to forgive us of it it's going to sit there, and it's going to fester, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse as it goes. And he can attack that, and he's, he's going to exploit it. Like I said, Ephesians 4.27 says, neither give place to the devil. Don't give him a place in your life. When you, you, when you mess up, when you sin, like I say, ask God for forgiveness, ask him to you know, cleanse you, and the Bible says that he will because he's faithful and just, right? And holiness uh, closes the door to the devil and helps us uh, helps protect us from his attacks. This is why it says in Romans chapter six verse twelve, "Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey uh, obey it in the lust thereof." The longer we let sin stay in there, the longer it's going to reign. 
and it's longer it's going to control you. So tonight, that was just my introduction, but don't worry, it's, it's going to go a lot quicker on this. Tonight, as I say, we're going to discuss uh, spiritual warfare, and uh, you know we're going to look at the the boots of peace. And so, you know, where Paul says uh, that we are uh, we are to stand with our feet shod with the gospel of peace. So let's look at that in verse 15. As, uh, as it says, it says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Most people will look at that and say, well, you know what? That's got to be the gospel. That's got to be tell, you know, taking the gospel somewhere, and we're going to get into that, whether or not that, that's what this means or not. So number one is this. Why, the, uh, why, are, uh, why are these boots are desired? Why should we you know, worry about whether, you know, why should we worry about our feet, basically? But we take, you know, think about it. We often take shoes for granted. The only time that we notice them is like when they got a hole in them or, you know, or the soles start, you know, flapping. When they stop doing their job that they're supposed to, when they're so worn out, that's when we start to notice them, right? That oftentimes we take them for granted, but they are a very important part of our apparel. It's not just the fact of just to look good. If, you're, if the shoes don't, you know, feel right, if the, you know, the shoes aren't, whatever, it's going to cause blisters, it's going to cause all kinds of problems, Right? We, uh, you know, and to think about it, we have, oftentimes we have different shoes for nearly every kind of activity that we do. I mean, I personally have like dress shoes, I have casual shoes, I have work shoes, I have shoes that I wear, you know, when I'm wa- you know, walking at the rec center. I have a lot of shoes, but my wife has a, little, a few more than I do. And the thing is, is what I plan to do on that day, uh, and on any given day, determines the type of shoes that I'll put on. I'm not going to wear dress shoes if I plan on working outside in the yard. You know, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to work, you know, uh, you know, work boots when I come into church. I'm just not, you know, th- there's no reason for it. But, you know, let's face it, we often don't think about our shoes, but we should be grateful for them. They protect our, uh, our feet from many dangers uh, of walking around going barefoot. If we were to go around barefoot, our feet would be a whole lot worse. I know that my, my daughter, in the summer, you cannot get that girl to wear a pair of shoes. My wife is the same way. And they'll, they'll go around and whatever, and I'm all about it, but the thing is, is that I, I've stepped on many things in a yard, so that's why a lot of times I, you know, I, have, I, I put on a pair of shoes because I've stepped on stuff that was not there the day before, all of a sudden it just appears. And I, you know, I hate limping around but think about you know like i say uh, think about how important certain shoes are for certain professions construction workers would be cr- uh, crazy to try and do their jobs without uh, the proper foot, uh, footwear if construction workers went out there with uh, dress shoes what's the point right could you imagine a football player walking down to the field without cleats could you imagine a baseball player doing that as well what about a tennis player the thing is, is that we know that for athletes, that they put on the right kind of shoes and those things. As important as shoes are to an athlete, a construction worker, you know, businessman, a housewife, or even a toddler, they are even more important to a soldier. I mean, think about a soldier. A soldier's life uh, depends on their shoes, could depend on, on, on the shoes that they wear. Soldiers are required to march long distances, fight battles in all types of environments, walk through, the jungle, uh, through jungles over rocks, Cross uh, streams, uh, bed, uh, stream beds uh, filled with sharp, jagged rocks. Um, they're supposed to go through snow and even through, oftentimes, you know, uh, a burning desert, you know, uh, because of the, the sun being so hot. If a soldier's feet becomes swollen, tender, cut, or blistered, that soldier is going to be greatly hindered in a day of battle. They're not going to be able to do what they're supposed to do. The soldier might not be able to stand and fight. He might not even be able to march because of his feet being uh, hurt. He might not be able uh, to properly handle his weapons. He certainly cannot advance again, uh, on the enemy. Sore feet can undermine the soldier's ability to stand firm. Think about it. You don't really ever you know, think about your feet until you stub your toe or you've hurt it. I remember a couple years ago, we were down you know, on vacation, and Lily and I, we got one of those little scooter things, a little motorized scooter, and I told her, I said, okay, you stand up in the front, hold on like this. I'll go in the back, and I'll go like this, and going down there. She got off balance, and I kicked my foot into the pavement. 
And so my toe for two years, that nail, you know, just did not grow back. And finally it did, you know, it grew back right. And now they're like, yeah, now you have arthritis in that toe. And that toe hurts. I tell you, it stinks getting old. But just the fact of stubbing your toe, like, on the, on the pavement, trying to, like, catch your daughter so she doesn't, you know, uh, hurt herself, you know, you don't think about that big toe until you have to try and walk on it after it's, like, swollen. Or you, you, know, or you broke it or whatever. I don't think I broke it because the doctor never said that it was. But, but so Paul, like I said, it keeps on using the, the whole armor of God because of the fact that uh, the soldiers back then, the Roman soldiers, wore leather boots that protected their feet and their ankles. And they wanted to be able to advance towards their enemy without being, without being distracted about what they stepped on. They didn't want to sit there and go, oh, I stepped on a nail. Or I stepped on a cactus, or whatever it is out that way. You know, they wanted to make sure that they were able to go, and their, their whole purpose was upon the enemy. Because if you're worried about your feet in a battle, you're going to get taken out. So this piece of armor is, like, is essential to that preparation you know, for battle. And, you know, and the boots, that they, uh, and they had you know, a special way of, of making these boots. I'm not going to go into all that detail. But if you're going to stand against the wiles of the devil, we must have you know, proper uh, spiritual footwear. We can be uh, girt about with the truth, and we can have on, uh, on the breastplate of righteousness, but if we neglect to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, we are destined to stumble and fall. So what did these boots uh, depict? The word preparation refers to being ready, that when it says to be, you know, uh, you know uh, with the preparation of the gospel of peace, it means to be ready. The same word appears in uh, Titus 3.1, which says, put, in, uh, put them in mind to be subject to the principalities and powers to obey magistrates to be ready for every good work. A soldier allows him to be ready for whatever, a soldier's boots allows them to be ready for whatever they face that day. They know what's going to uh, go on. So what kind of readiness does this refer to? In one sense, a person could, sit there, uh, could say that, well, a child of God must always be ready uh, to be about the Father's business, about sharing the gospel with the lost world, right? And then that's what we think. We are to be, you know, we are to uh, be uh, to move at the Lord's command, uh, going uh, from place to place, preaching the gospel to the lost and telling them about Jesus. But there's a sense in in which all believe, and, and there's a sense that in which all believers are to be actively engaged in sharing the gospel. Paul uh, Peter said it this way. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and, all, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of, uh, of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. When God saved us, he commanded us to tell others about him, right? He told us to go share the gospel. <clears throat> and I believe, obviously, you know, you guys have heard me many a times say, you know, uh, preach the fact that sharing the gospel uh, with the lost, you know, advances the kingdom of God, that we believe that, right? But what it, um, let me go back here. Yep, all right. Just making sure I was right on what I said there. All right. So what, uh, number three is, what, or number two, sorry, what uh, these boots uh, deliver. In my opinion, this is my opinion, this isn't Paul's primary emphasis in the text is to go and share the gospel. He's not, that's not his primary emphasis in, uh, in the text. Um, is not on, on going, but it's on standing. Paul is not talking about sharing the gospel, or, uh, but he is talking about fighting Satan. The gospel of peace refers to the glorious news that through our relationship with Jesus Christ, we are at peace with God. That's what he is talking about. He's talking about the fact that when we were not saved, and then when we came out of that darkness and, you know, into the light, we, that when we did get saved, that he is talking about the fact that now we have peace with God. Because before, before that, you were an enemy of God. But now you have peace with God. When he saved us, he reconciled us to himself. When he did, he declared, uh, he declared us to be at peace with him. We see this in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he is talking about. 
Now, in Jesus, the saints are at peace with God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 says this, And you that were uh, sometime alienated and enemies in, uh, in your mind by wicked works, yet now uh, have he reconciled in the body of his flesh through, uh, through death to present, your, uh, present, present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. In other words, the gospel of peace here is referring to the marvelous news that in Christ we are at peace with the Lord. So here's some examples of, I'm not going to share all of them, but here's some examples of this kind of peace that abound in the Bible. The children of Israel, under the leadership of Gideon, witnessed the Lord, witnessed the Lord reduce the size of their army from 32,000 to 300. They had 32,000, they said, oh great, and the Lord said, no. It's too many. Got all the way down to 300. Now this ain't like that movie, you know, the 300, which was based off of a real, uh, a real event, which was the 300 in which uh, um, the Spartans back at Thermopylae decided, you know, to fight against Persia, and they kept on fighting until every single one of them died, you know, and, and pretty much took out the entire army. No, this one's better. This is better than the movies, all right? This is better than, than even that story uh, that they say was true back then. Those 300 uh, placed their confidence in the Lord and followed him into battle. They saw the Lord defeat an immense Midian army without the use of a single weapon. I mean, how do you beat an entire army without a weapon? With the Lord. All, those, uh, all, the, men, all the men did was break clay jars, allowing a lamp inside uh, to shine, blow a trumpet and cry, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. That's all they did. Their faith was in the Lord's promise that he gave them that confidence to stand. He just said, do this. I mean, think about it. Think about back at Jericho. They're going around there. They're walking around each time. The last day, they, they walk around and everything else. The people in Jericho could have just started launching spears at them or, or arrows and just took them out. But they believed that that's the way the Lord would have them to do it. And what ended up happening? The walls fell, right? I mean, think about uh, Simon Peter when he drew his sword against the soldiers who came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He did this because he had just seen the whole group fall to the ground when they asked Jesus if he was the one that they had sought. They, asked, they said, Jesus you know, uh, of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And they fell to the ground. They were, they just, you know, uh, in that moment, Peter felt like he was invincible. And he was ready uh, to take on the whole entire army. Of course, he got uh, you know, rebuked, you know, rebuked by the Lord because the Lord said, you know what, this is, you know, those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. But in that, the fact is, is that he knew in whom he had trusted. His, tr his, his trust was a little misguided, but he still he had that confidence in the Lord. The redeemed child of God who stands in the Lord's power and in the full assurance of the Lord's salvation does not have to fear any enemy, even if that enemy is Satan himself. When we are attacked, we stand on the firm, unchanging ground of the gospel of peace. The same gospel that converted us from sinners into saints. The same gospel that changed God uh, from our enemy into our protector. We who were on the outside and are, and are now the sons of God, he is our heavenly father and we are his children. Amen? Our confidence is not... Oh, sorry, our confidence in the day of battle does not rest in our own power, but it, uh, but it rests in the promises of God. He is what he, uh, he, uh, he sorry, here's a, here's a portion of scripture in Romans chapter 8, where he, uh, what he promises to his children. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39 says this, What shall we say then uh, to these things? If God uh, be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up uh, for us all, how shall he not with uh, him also freely give, uh, give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also uh, makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That is the promises of God right there. That nothing is going to separate you from the love of Christ. That nothing will. And Paul would know this because all the stuff that he, he pretty much said as far as the sword and the tribulation and distress and persecution, he went through. So he knows. He had a first-hand account of those things. Those promises, those truths are the, the shoes that give us the ability to stand in the evil day. That promise, that gospel of peace that has, you know, that has given us peace with God, where we are once enemies, we are now at peace with God. We have been reconciled. We have been brought out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. That's our feet, shod with the, uh, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Because we know, remember as I said this, the, uh, earlier in this, is the fact that we're not, you know, that we're standing firm, right? We're not giving them an inch. Because you know why? Because there's all the things that he wants, you know, to take away from us. And we say, you know what? God has already given me a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm not giving it back. That's what it is. That's what he is telling us. The truth that we are loved by the Lord gives us the confidence to stand. You have people out here that one day will say, you know, they love us, and the next day they say that they hate us. You have one person that says that, you know, they love us, and then the next thing they're spitting in your face. Or they're, or, or they're lying about you. Christ will never do that to you. Nothing is going to be able to take us out of, you know, uh, Christ's hand, out of the Father's hand. Nothing will. Nothing is able to pluck us out of his hand. Nothing. You say, well, what happens if I do this particular sin? Nothing. Because salvation is eternal. You can't give it back. Even if you wanted to, in which you don't want to. Even if you mess up, you can't, uh, it's not going to go away. It's a gift. God doesn't take, he's, he, he, he doesn't like give you a gift and then just take it back just because you messed up. That would be like you on Christmas Day because your child all of a sudden sassed you back and say, whoops, sorry, there go all your presents. He's not going to do that. Where we might, he won't. He's never going to do that. It's a gift, eternal life. It's, it's, the Bible says that once you, uh, you have believed on him, you have eternal life. It's not something like a future thing. No, you have it. So in other words, from that moment, if you, know, if you die right after that moment you got saved, you're going to heaven. Or whether it's 50, 60, 70, 80 years down the line, you're going to go to heaven. Because he's not going to take that away from you. Now the thing is, is whether or not you backslide or not. Backsliding has nothing to do with your salvation. Backsliding has to do with your fellowship with God. I talked about this a couple of weeks on a Sunday morning, the fellowship with the Father. That the longer that we hold on to sin, the longer that we let sin reign in our mortal body, the longer we let it sit, the further, you know, uh, the further the separation of that relationship or that fellowship goes. It's just like when you have you know, an issue with your brother or sister or your parents. If you have a problem with them and you don't talk to them, there's a separation that happens until things are reconciled. But you never stop being that son, that daughter, that husband or wife. Never, right? You don't say, well, you know, if you get a divorce or anything else. No, God wants, you know, wanted marriage to be forever and ever. But he knows that, you know, that happens. But God's not going to do that. He's never going to divorce you. He's faithful. The truth that we are saved by his grace gives us the confidence to stand. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing, you know, anything other than that. The Bible says, for it is by grace are you saved through faith, right? The truth that we are his children gives us the confidence to stand. The truth that we in his tender care 
and that he, is, uh, he has promised to stand with us, to protect us, to keep us, defend us, gives us confidence to stand. The Bible says that he is one that sticks closer than a brother. He is never going to leave you. He is never going to forsake you. So when you, you stand firm on, you know, on that evil day, know that these are the promises of God, that he's not going to leave you, he's not going to forsake you, that nothing is going to be able to separate you from the love of God, that no matter what happens, you have Christ. That no matter what happens. Amen? I don't know about you, but that brings a, you know, a smile to my face. Because I think about the fact that, you know, like, you know, uh, back, you know, a while ago, you know, when I thought that I could, you know, th- that I can mess it up, that when I thought that I could lose my salvation, and I, and I thought all those things, that's more nerve-wracking than the fact of making your spouse angry. But when you read God's word and you read exactly what it says, and he says that nothing, that you're never going to, he's never going to leave you, he's never going to forsake you, that nothing is going to be able to pluck you out of his hand, that none of these things, that nothing's going to be able to separate you from his love, It brings a smile to your face because you can't mess it up. Because if we could mess it up, we would. Right? Amen. The boots of peace are important because we have peace with God. So the question here is this. Are you ready to stand? Do you have absolute confidence in your heart that God has saved your soul, forgiven your sins, and adopted you into his family. If you, have that kind of, uh, if you have that kind of confidence, you can stand regardless of what the enemy throws at you. If you don't have that deep, settled confidence in your heart, you will be unstable in all your battles. You will be. Unless you are grounded in the absolute assurance of your salvation, the enemy will have little trouble knocking you off your feet. If you don't have that assurance of your salvation, if you don't have, you know, uh, don't recognize the promises of God, he's going to sit there and he's like, oh, there it is. There's the crack in the armor that I need. And he's going to take full advantage of it. He's not going to pass it up. Here's the thing. You can be sure. You can be sure of your salvation. Why? Because God wanted you to know that you have eternal life. First John chapter uh, 5. First John chapter 5 verse 13. It says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. So what is he saying? If you believe on the name of the Son of God, he says, these things, I'm writing it to you. I want you to know this. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. And, ye that, uh, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So when you have believed on the name of the Son of God, what does it say? You have eternal life. You have it. That's that assurance you have. God wants you to know it. He doesn't want you to guess. He wants you to know that you have it. I've met many a people especially ones you know, that believe that you could lose your salvation, will say, well, I hope I've done good enough. Well, I hope so. I hope I make it to heaven. Now, the Bible says you can know that you know that you know that you have eternal life. Amen? You can have the confidence that all is well. You can know him and his power to stand. You can uh, be stable, strong, and sure to have the stability that you need to be sure uh, uh, you are saved. When you are, the enemy will have a hard time with you because you will be able to withstand uh, withstand in the evil day and having done all, you will be able to stand. Do you have on the right shoes? If the Lord has spoken to you about the matter, you know, about the fact that, you know what, that you're in a backslidden state, get, uh, get your life right with the Lord. Remember, he is faithful and just. Just so you know, when you, if you're in that backslidden state and he, and he comes at you, know, he's going to come at you when you try, you know, the enemy's going to come at you when you try to make things right. When you go to before the Lord, you know, when you, uh, you ask him for forgiveness to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, 
When you do that, the enemy's going to come after you and say, he didn't really do that. Do you really think that God's going to forgive you? You may not be able to forgive yourself, but God has forgiven you. God, if you have asked the Lord to forgive you, to cleanse you, the Bible says he's faithful and just. Our trust is in him, not how we feel. Your feelings, my feelings change. There's days where I feel like I'm saved and other days I don't. But I don't trust my feelings. The Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Your heart, your feelings are going to lie to you. How many times, you know, like I said before, a person says, I love you. I love you with everything. And then all of a sudden the next, you know, like a month or two later, I hate you. Lose my phone number. You know, all these things. I don't ever want to see your face again. All that kind of stuff. God is never going to say that to you. God is never going to say that to you. But if you're in that backslidden state, the reason why God is speaking to you about specific things is because he wants you to get rid of those things. That way you realize them and you can move forward. He wants you to be able to move forward. He wants you, as we've been talking about on Sunday morning, he wants you to get up off the mat and move forward. He doesn't want you laying down on the ground going, oh, woe is me. I'm out of the battle. I'm on the sidelines. I might as well just give up. No, he says, you know what? Get up. And the way you get up is that you ask him to forgive you. You ask him to cleanse you. And what does he do? Exactly that. His word, I can go to him. Why? Because I know his truth, right? If the Lord has spoken to you over the next few moments and stuff, I know that obviously this is supposed to be a Bible study time, but I want us to, if that's us, where there's something that we know that there's some sort of sin that is holding on, that you know we've let rain in our bodies, get it out. Like any kind of like, you know, any kind of you know cut that maybe you know have festering or whatever, clean it out by asking Him to cleanse you, by asking Him to forgive you. So for the next few, a few moments, if that is you, I ask that you would do that. Get your life right so you can get up off the mat, and that way you can know that peace again that, you know, that you know, seems to be missing.